My VO2 Max dropped and honestly, I couldn't care less because despite what my fancy running smartwatch and my lab test says, I'm running faster than I ever have in my entire life. Here's why that number on your watch and even in the lab might be lying to you when it comes to performance in the real world. I'll be going over why VO2 Max isn't the whole story with science to back all of this up, where to put your focus so you're training the stuff that actually moves your race times, why a small drop in my VO2 max like mine doesn't mean that I'm falling apart, how to train without obsessing over a single metric, and a free download to help you improve your VO2 max right now. I'm Darren D. Lake, running coach, 30-year runner slash endurance athlete, full-on data nerd, looking to help 10,000 self-coach runners just like you get 1% better every day and improving their VO2 max and separating all the good signal from all that bad noise. Let's get into the episode the misunderstanding, and why the number messes with your head. Most runners treat that VO2 max number like a school grade. Garmin and Koros and all the other smartwatches tell you it's up and you're a genius. It dips and suddenly you're Googling iron deficiencies at 2 a.m. on your phone when you should be sleeping. Jack Daniels, a pioneer in VO2 max training from decades ago and his VDOT free online calculator, while way more accurate than the smartwatch stuff, Garmin's, etc., it reverse engineers a VO2-ish score from your race times or workouts. Helpful, sure. Perfect, no. Lab tests measure VO2 max directly. And even that is just one piece of a bigger jigsaw puzzle. Quick run science nerd break defining VO2 max. So back in 1923, yes, over 100 years ago, researchers Hill and Lupton were the first to really nail down what we call now VO2 max. They discovered there's a ceiling to how much oxygen your body can actually use during exercise, even if you push harder. VO2 max is the maximum rate your body can consume oxygen during exercise. It's still aerobic, but fueled by a whole lot of glycogen, aka carbs, when you're going that hard. That's why it hurts and it helps. It's basically your body's oxygen processing horsepower. What about zone one and zone two training? Yes, base training nudges VO2 max up slowly, builds a foundation, builds a concrete, builds the pillars, etc. It's also the scenic route of getting to a high VO2 max. And your smartwatch, Garmin, Koros, etc., those VO2 max scores, it's algorithm based. It's limited inputs that only focus on a high heart rate and pace and time at that heart rate. So treat the smartwatch VO2 max score like the weather. It's a useful trend, something to go, oh, cool, but it's not absolute truth gospel. Here's an analogy to help it stick. VO2 max is like a car engine size. A big engine is a potentially fast car, but your watch, it's guessing engine size by doing something like listening to the idle of the engine, the sound of the engine. Sometimes close, sometimes not. And race performance, that's not just engine size. It's gearing, aerodynamics, the driver, the tires, the road, the weather. You get it. Let's zoom out to distance running. What predicts performance changes with race length? For marathons and half marathons, that's going to be lactate threshold and running economy. They explain why more fast people are fast. So having high lactate threshold and really good running economy. But for 5K and shorter races, VO2 max matters much more. So think different tools for different jobs. In this episode, it's about choosing the right tools. So if VO2 max isn't king for longer stuff, what should you focus on instead? The real drivers of speed. So there's two levers that runners underuse, lactate threshold and running economy. Let's talk about the first one, lactate threshold. This is the fastest pace that you can hold before the wheels start wobbling. So whatever you can hold for 45 to 60 minute run going quote unquote all out. That's usually for half and full marathons. It's your money metric. It's exactly where you want to be. You want to train this very well. But for 5K, one mile, 3K races, two mile races, etc. And shorter, VO2 max comes back into the spotlight as your hero. But you still want a higher ceiling. You still need that lactate threshold. And then number two, running economy. Not how pretty you look, but how much oxygen you need to maintain at a given pace. Better economy equals lower oxygen cost per mile or kilometer. Translation, spend less to go the same speed or spend the same to go faster. This is also related to an efficient running form. Run science, nerd break. Threshold is the temperature your car can cruise at before overheating. Economy is your fuel efficiency, how far you can go in that same tank. Here's something to note. Research going back to 1980s. Shouts to scientists, I'm going to destroy their names, Conley and Cranblu and Sojin and Svendenhag found that among competitive runners, 
Threshold and Economy were actually better predictors of race performance than VO2 max. Why? Once you're reasonably fit, most runners, they cluster within a similar VO2 max range. But Threshold and Economy, that's where the real separation happens. It's like having a bunch of cars with the same size engine. The winners are determined by who can run cooler, burn less fuel, and just drive better. If you're like, hey, Darren, I want to use this information right now. Dope. So good. Download my free VO2 max booster plan. It's a short, clean training block that slots into normal training so you can touch VO2 max without turning your legs into toast for everything else. You could show up for more workouts, show up for your life, and you're not tired all the time. Get it. The QR code here, link below in your show notes. Back to the episode. This is what focus looks like in training and how to do proper threshold and run economy improving workouts. Threshold intervals. You can do two to three, seven to 10 minutes at threshold pace with a two to three minutes easy jog. You teach your body to shuttle and reuse lactate instead of panicking. You can do hills for running economy uh, with nuance. So you could do anywhere from six to 10, depending on your fitness and your race goals, anywhere from 30 to 60 seconds uphill, about probably four to 6% grade, not too steep, not too flat. And then you easy jog down. It's great for leg strength and potentially better running economy. Though research is mixed specifically on the economy games, you can keep it powerful, not sloppy. It just feels good. Also helps a bit of VO2 max. Long, steady state. So 60 to 90 minutes at a controlled, I can hold this for a while effort. Builds durability and high aerobic power. Think high zone two, low zone three. So your late race self doesn't hate you and doesn't sabotage you and thinks that we need to tap out of this race. So zoom out to science. Again, VO2 max plus running economy together explain a massive chunk of performance variance in train runners to the order of 94% in some context. That doesn't mean that VO2 max is useless. It means running economy plus VO2 max and by extension V VO2 max. We won't get into the weeds of that. It's where compounding happens. Small asterisk so we stay honest. Training responses vary a lot between humans. You're not a spreadsheet. You're a person. But broadly speaking, this is the pattern. You know what's best? Consistency and focus. That's what allows you to get better at your race times and stay injury free. My results. So context is greater than number. Seven years ago, my lab VO2 max test was about 56 millibars per kilogram per minute of oxygen. So that's how they measure VO2 max. A few months ago, it read 54, two points lower, small but real. A few things to note, VO2 max naturally declines with age. So a rough estimate is about 1% per year after 30. Then as you get into your 40s and 50s, it drops even faster, 60s. So some drop over seven years into my early 40s is totally expected. Lab tests are gold standard accurate for VO2 max, but they aren't perfect. Even in healthy people, you can see 2 to 4% test retest variability. Depending on protocol equipment they use, uh, the person doing the test, variability on the day, you as a human, don't freak out over tiny swings. Training focus matters. When I took the test, I wasn't hammering VO2 max workouts, so my VO2 was not at its optimal place. It also wasn't seven years ago too, so that's where the, the asterisk is. <laughs> when I did the VO2 max test a few months ago, I was in marathon on focus block, aerobic base, sub-threshold, durability, lots of zone two, zone three work. So the engine size metric, it dipped a bit, that big VO2 max engine. But I still got faster because of all the other metrics. The lesson, focus is better than fixation. Pick the levers that move your race because that's the most important thing, not just some random number. I'll be talking more about focus in my upcoming book, The 1% Better Runner. So stay tuned for that. Just want to do a quick plug. If you want the fast, sane way to nudge your VO2 max up, grab that free download VO2 max plan. It's going to help you get faster in a smart, strategic way so you can sequence and plan all your workouts throughout the weeks, etc. And as a bonus, you'll automatically sign up for my five minutes or less weekly newsletter. I'll do deep dives like this VO2 max episode, but also threshold stuff, sub threshold stuff, tempo, long run strides mental fitness that's a big one get it at the qr code here link below or in your show notes but ignoring your vo2 max is one part of the fast performance equation if you want to really get faster at distance running learn all about why strides sprints run throughs and wind ups can help your running economy that other thing that helps you race faster get that here or link below or in the show notes of your podcast app